Section 1 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dusty Brailsford. Common Sense in the Household, a Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marian Harland. Introductory of Revised Edition. It is not yet quite ten years since the publication of Common Sense in the Household General Receipts. In offering the work to the publishers under whose able management it has prospered so wonderfully, I said, I have written this because I felt that such a manual of practical housewifery is needed, that I judged aright, taking my own experience as a housekeeper as the criterion of the wants and perplexities of others, is abundantly proved by the circumstance which calls for this new and revised edition of the book. Through much and constant use, nearly 100,000 copies have been printed from them. The stereotype plates have become so worn that the impressions are faint and sometimes illegible. I gladly avail myself of the opportunity thus offered to reread and so far to alter the original volume as may, in the light of later improvements in the culinary art and in my understanding of it, make the collection of family receipts more intelligible and available nor have I been able to resist the temptation to interpolate a few excellent receipts that have come into my hands at a later period than that of the publication of the last, and in my estimation, perhaps the most valuable of the Common Sense series, v. The Dinner Yearbook. I am grateful also to the courtesy of my publishers for the privilege of thanking those to whom this book was and is dedicated, my fellow housekeepers, North, East, South, and West for their substantial endorsement of the work I have done in their behalf. A collection of the private letters I have received from those who have used the general receipts would make a volume very nearly as large as this. If I have, as the writers of these testimonials assure me, done them good, they have done me more in letting me know that I have not spent my strength for naught. I acknowledge with pleasure sundry pertinent suggestions and inquiries which have led me, in this revision, to examine warily the phraseology of some receipts and to modify these, I believe, for the better. But by far, the best good done me through this work has been the conscious sisterhood into which I have come with the great body of American housewives. This is a benefit not to be rated by dollars and cents or measured by time. I hope my fellow workers will find their old kitchen companion in fresh dress, yet more serviceable than before, and that their daughters may, at the close of a second decade, demand new stereotype plates for still another and, like this, a progressive edition. Marion Harland, October 1, 1880. End of section 1. Recording by Dusty Brailsford. Section 2 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Common Sense in the Household A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harland. Familiar Talk with My Fellow Housekeeper and Reader. A talk as woman to woman, in which each shall say, I, and you, and my dear, and you know, as freely as she pleases. It would not be a womanly chat if we omitted these forms of expression. An informal preface to what I mean shall be an informal book, bristling with eyes all the way through. If said bristles offend the critic's touch, let him remember that this work is not prepared for the library, but for readers who trouble themselves a little about editorial wheeze, and the circumlocutions of literary modesty. I wish it were in my power to bring you, the prospective owner of this volume, in person, as I do in spirit, to my side on this winter evening, when the baronies are folded like the flocks, the order for breakfast committed to the keeping of Bridget or Gretchen or Chloe, or the plans for the morrow definitely laid in the brain of that ever-busy but most independent of women, the housekeeper who does her own work. I should perhaps summon to our cosy conference a very wary companion, wary of foot, of hand, and I should not deserve to be your confidant, did I not know how often heart-weary with discouragement, with much producing of ways and means, with a certain despondent looking forward to the monotonous grinding of the household machine, to the certainty, proved by past experience, that toilsome as has been this day, 
the morrow will prove yet more abundant in labours in trials of strength and nerves and temper you would tell me what a dreary problem this of woman's work that is never done is to your fainting soul how try as you may and as you do to be systematic and diligent something is always turning up in the treadmill to keep you on the strain how you often say to yourself in bitterness of spirit that it is a mistake of christian civilization to educate girls into a love of science and literature and then condemn them to the routine of a domestic drudge you do not see you say that years of scholastic training will make you a better cook or better wife or mother you have seen the time nay many times since assuming your present position when you would have exchanged your knowledge of ancient and modern languages belles lettres music and natural science for the skill of a competent kitchen-maid the learning how is such hard work labour too uncheered by encouraging words from mature housewives unsoftened by sympathy even from your husband or your father or brother or whoever may be the one to whom you make home lovely it may be that in utter discouragement you have made up your mind that you have no talent for these things i have before me now the picture of a wife the mother of four children who many years ago sickened me for all time with that phrase in a slatternly morning gown at four in the afternoon leaning back in the laziest and most ragged of rocking chairs dust on the carpet on the open piano the mantle the mirrors even on her own hair she rubbed the soft palm of one hand with the grimy fingers of the other and with a sickly sweet smile whined out now i am one of the kind who have no talent for such things the kitchen and housework and sewing are absolutely hateful to me utterly uncongenial to my turn of mind the height of my earthly ambition is to have nothing to do but to paint on velvet all day i felt then in the height of my indignant disgust that there was propriety as well as wit in the spectator's suggestion that every young woman should before fixing the wedding day be compelled by law to exhibit to inspectors a prescribed number of useful articles as her outfit napery bed linen clothing etc made by her own hands and that it would be wise legislation which should add to these proofs of her fitness for her new sphere a practical knowledge of housework and cookery if you have not what our yankee grandmothers termed a faculty for housewifery yet are obliged as is the case with an immense majority of american women to conduct the affairs of a household bills of fare included there is the more reason for earnest application to your profession if the natural taste be dull lay to it more strength of will resolution born of a just sense of the importance of the knowledge and dexterity you would acquire do not scoff at the word profession call not that common and unclean which providence has designated as your life-work i speak not now of the labours of the culinary department alone but without naming the other duties which you and you only can perform i do insist that upon method skill economy in the kitchen depends so much of the well-being of the rest of the household that it may be safely be styled the root the foundation of housewifery i own it would be pleasanter in most cases especially to those who have cultivated a taste for intellectual pursuits to live above the heat and odour of this department it must be very fine to have an efficient aide-de-camp in the person of a french cook or a competent sub-manager or an accomplished head-waiter who receives your order for the day in your boudoir or library and executes the same with zeal and discretion that leave you no room for anxiety or regret such mistresses do not need cookery books the few and it must be borne in mind that in this country these are very few born in an estate like this would not comprehend what i am now writing would not enter into the depths of that compassionate yearning which moves me as i think of what i have known for myself in the earlier years of my wedded life what i have heard and seen in other households of honest intentions brought to contempt of ill-directed toil of mortification and the heavy wearing sense of inferiority that puts the novice at such a woeful disadvantage in a community of notable managers there is no use in enlarging upon this point you and i might compare experiences by the hour without exhausting our store and then you sigh with a sense of resentment upon you however amiable your disposition for the provocation is dire cookery books and young housekeeper's assistants and all that sort of thing are such humbugs dark lanterns at best too often will o the wisps my dear would you mind handing me the book which lies nearest you on the table there dickens of course 
you will usually find something of his in every room in this house almost as surely as you will a bible it rests and refreshes one to pick him up at odd times and dip in anywhere here the bride mrs john rokesmith upon her common grievance she was under the constant necessity of referring for advice and support to a sage volume entitled the complete british family housewife which she would sit consulting with her elbows upon the table and her temples in her hands like some perplexed enchantress poring over the black art this principally because the complete british housewife however sound a Briton at heart was by no means an expert Briton at expressing herself with clearness in the british tongue and sometimes might have issued her directions to equal purpose in the kamchatkan language don't interrupt me my long-suffering sister there is more of the same sort to come there was likewise a coolness on the part of the complete british housewife which mrs john rokesmith found highly exasperating she would say take a salamander as if a general should command a private to catch a tartar or she would casually issue the order throw in a handful of something entirely unattainable in these the housewife's most glaring moments of unreason bella would shut her up and knock her on the table apostrophizing her with the compliment oh you are a stupid old donkey where am i to get it do you think when i took possession of my first real home the prettily furnished cottage to which i came as a bride more full of hope and courage than if i had been wiser five good friends presented me with as many cookery books each complete and all by different compilers one day's investigation of my menage convinced me that my lately hired servants knew no more about cookery than i did or affected stupidity to develop my capabilities or ignorance too proud to let them suspect the truth or to have it bruited abroad as a topic for pitying or contemptuous gossip i shut myself up with my complete housewives and inclined seriously to the study of the same comparing one with the other and seeking to shape a theory which should grow into practice in accordance with the best authority i don't like to remember that time the question of disagreeing doctors and the predicament of falling between two stools are trivial perplexities when compared with my strife and failure said the would-be studious countryman to whom a mischievous acquaintance lent webster's unabridged dictionary as an entertaining volume i wrestled and i wrestled and i wrestled with it but i couldn't get up much of an interest my wrestling begat naught save pitiable confusion hopeless distress and a three days sick headache during which season i am not sure that i did not darkly contemplate suicide as the only sure escape from the meshes that girt me at the height or depth of my despondency a friend one with a great heart and steady brain came to my rescue her cheerful laugh over my dilemma rings down to me now through all these years refreshing me as it then saluted my ears bless your innocent little heart she cried in her fresh gay voice ninety-nine out of a hundred cookbooks are written by people who never kept house and the hundred by a good cook who yet doesn't know how to express herself to the enlightenment of others compile a receipt book for yourself make haste slowly learn one thing at a time and when you have mastered it make a note on it as captain cuttle says never losing sight of the principle that you must do it in order to learn how then she opened to me her own neatly written manual the work of years recommending as i seized it that i should commence my novitiate with simple dishes this was the beginning of the hoard of practical receipts i now offer for your inspection for twenty years i have steadily pursued this work gleaning here and sifting there and levying such remorseless contributions upon my friends that i fear the sight of my paper and pencil has long since become a bugbear for the kindness and courtesy which have been my invariable portion in this quest i hereby return hearty thanks for the encouraging words and good wishes that have ever answered the hint of my intention to collect what had proved so valuable to me into a printed volume i declare myself to be yet more adepter i do not claim for my compen the proud preeminence of the complete american housewife it is no boastful system of cookery taught in twelve lessons and i should write myself down a knave or a fool were i to assert that a raw cook or ignorant mistress can by half a day's study of my collection equal sawyer or blot or even approximate the art of a half-taught scullion we may as well start from the right point if we hope to continue friends you must learn the rudiments of the art for yourself 
Practice and practice alone will teach you certain essentials. The management of the ovens, the requisite thickness of boiling custards, the right shade of brown upon bread and roasted meats. These and dozens of other details are hints which cannot be imparted by written or oral instructions. But, once learned, they are never forgotten, and henceforward your fate is in your own hands. You are mistress of yourself, though servants leave. Have faith in your own abilities. You will be a better cook for the mental training you have received at school and from books. Brains tell everywhere, to say nothing of intelligent observation, just judgment, a faithful memory, and orderly habits. Consider that you have a profession, as I said just now, and resolve to understand it in all its branches. My book is designed to help you. I believe it will, if for no other reason, because it has been a faithful guide to myself. A reference beyond value in seasons of doubt and need. I have brought every receipt to the test of common sense and experience. Those which I have not tried myself were obtained from trustworthy housewives, the best I know. I have enjoyed the task heartily, and from first to last the persuasion has never left me that I was engaged in a good cause. Throughout I have had you, my dear sister, present before me, with the little plate between your brows, the wistful look about eye and mouth that revealed to me, as words could not, your desire to do your best. In a humble home and in a humble way, I hear you add, perhaps. You are not ambitious, you only want to help John and to make him and the children comfortable and happy. Heaven reward your honest, loyal endeavours. Would you mind if I were to whisper a word in your ear I don't care to have progressive people hear? Although progress is a grand thing when it takes the right direction. My dear, John and the children and the humble home make your sphere for the present, you say. Be sure you fill it, full, before you seek one wider and higher. There is no better receipt between these covers than that. Leave the rest to God. Everybody knows those four lines of George Herbert's, which ought to be framed and hung up in the workroom of every house. A servant, with this clause, makes drudgery divine, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and the actions fine. I wonder if the sainted poet knows, in that land where drudgery is one of the rough places forever overpassed, and work is unmingled blessing, to how many sad and striving hearts those words have brought peace. And by way of helping John, not only by saving money and preparing palatable and wholesome dishes for his table, but by sparing the wife he loves many needless steps and much hurtful care, will you heed a homely hint or two relative to the practice of your art? study method an economy of time and strength no less than of materials i take it for granted that you are too intelligent to share in the vulgar prejudice against labour-saving machines a raisin cedar costs a trifle in comparison with the time and patience required to stone the fruit in the old way a good egg-beater the dover for instance is a treasure so with farina kettles, syllabub churns, apple corers, potato peelers and slicers, clothes ringers and sprinklers, and the like. Most of these are made of tin, are therefore cheap and easily kept clean. Let each article have its own place in the closet and kitchen, to which restore it so soon as you have done using it. Before undertaking the preparation of any dish, read over the receipt carefully, unless you are thoroughly familiar with the manufacture of it. Many excellent housewives have a fashion of saying loftily, when asked how such things are made, I carry all my receipts in my head, I never wrote out one in my life. And you, if timid and self-distrustful, are smitten with shame, keep your receipt book out of sight, and cram your memory with ingredients and measures, times and weights, for fear Mrs. Notable should suspect you of rawness and inefficiency. Whereas the truth is, that if you have a mind worthy of the name, its powers are too valuable to be laden with such details. Master the general principles, as I said just now, and for particulars, look to your marching orders. Having refreshed your memory by this reference, pick out from your household stores, and set in convenient order, within reach of your hand, everything you will need in making ready the particular compound under consideration. Then take your stand in the midst, or sit if you can, it is common sense. Oftentimes a pious duty to take judicious care of your physical health. I lay it down as a safe and imperative rule for kitchen use. Never stand when you can do your work as well while sitting. If I could have John's ear for a minute, I would tell him that which would lead him to watch you and exercise wholesome authority in this regard. 
Next, prepare each ingredient for mixing, that the bread, cake, pudding, soup, or ragout may not be delayed when half finished because the flour is not sifted, or the shortening warmed, the sugar and butter are not creamed, the meat is not cut up, or the herbs not minced. Don't begin until you are ready. Then go steadily forward, without haste, without rest, and think of what you are doing. Dickens again. Why not, since there is no more genial and pertinent philosopher of common life and everyday subjects? To quote, then, It was a maxim of Captain Swasser, said Mrs. Badger, speaking in his figurative naval manner, that when you make pitch hot, you cannot make it too hot, and that if you have only to swab a plank, you should swab it as if Davy Jones were after you. It appears to me that this maxim is applicable to the medical as well as the nautical profession. To all professions, observed Mr. Badger, it was admirably said by Captain Swasser, beautifully said. But it will sometimes happen that when you have heated your pitch, or swabbed your deck, or made your pudding according to the light set before you, the result is a failure. This is especially apt to occur in a maiden effort. You have wasted materials and time, and suffered, moreover, acute demoralization, or been wrapped in a wet blanket of discouragement, instead of the seemly robe of complacency. Yet no part of the culinary education is more useful, if turned to proper account, than this very discipline of failure. It is a stepping-stone to excellence. Sharp, it is true, but often sure. You have learned how not to do it right, which is the next thing to success. It is pretty certain that you will avoid, in your second essay, the rock upon which you have split this time. And, after all, there are few failures which are utter and irremediable. Scorched soups and custards, sour bread, biscuit yellow with soda, and cake heavy as lead, come under the head of hopeless. They are absolutely unfit to be set before civilized beings and educated stomachs. Should such mishaps occur, lock the memory of the attempt in your own bosom, and do not vex or amuse John and your guests with the narration, still less with visible proof of the calamity. Many a partial failure would pass unobserved but for the clouded brow and earnest apologies of the hostess. Do not apologize except at the last gasp. If there is but one chance in ten that a single person present may not discover the deficiency which has changed all food on the table to dust and gravel stones to you, trust to the one chance and carry off the matter bravely. You will be astonished to find, if you keep your wits about you, how often even your husband will remain in blissful ignorance that aught has gone wrong, if you do not tell him. You know so well what should have been the product of your labor that you exaggerate the justice of others' perceptions. Console yourself, furthermore, with the reflection that yours is not the first failure upon record, nor the million and first, and that there will be as many tomorrows as there have been yesterdays. Don't add to a trifling contretemps the real discomfort of a discontented or fretful wife. Say blithely, if John note your misfortune, I hope to do better another time, and do not be satisfied until you have redeemed your pledge. Experience and your quick wit will soon teach you how to avert impending evils of this nature, how to snatch your preparations from imminent destruction, and, by ingenious correctives or concealments, to make them presentable. These you will soon learn for yourself if you keep before you the truism I have already written, to wit, that few failures are beyond repair. Never try experiments for the benefit of invited guests, nor, when John is at home, risk the success of your meal upon a new dish. Have something which you know he can eat, and introduce experiments as by play. But do not be too shy of innovations in the shape of untried dishes. Variety is not only pleasant, but healthful. The least pampered palate will weary of stereotyped bills of fare. It is an idea which should have been exploded long ago, that plain roast, boiled and fried, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, codfish on Friday, with pork and beans every Saturday, are means of grace because economical. And with this should have vanished the prejudice against warmed-over meals, or réchauffé, as our French friends termed them. I have tried, in the following pages, to set forth the attractions of these, and their claims to your attentions as being savoury, economical, nourishing, and often elegant. In preparing these acceptably, everything depends upon your own taste and skill. Season with judgment, cook just enough and not a minute too long, and dish nicely. The recommendation of the eye to the palate is a point no cook can afford to disregard. If you can offer an unexpected visitor nothing better than bread and butter and cold ham, 
he will enjoy the luncheon twice as much if the bread be sliced thinly and evenly spread smoothly each slice folded in the middle upon the buttered surface and piled symmetrically if the ham be also cut thin scarcely thicker than a wafer and garnished with parsley cresses or curled lettuce set on mustard and pickles let the tablecloth and napkin be white and glossy the glass clear and plate shining clean and add to these accessories to comfort a bright welcome and my word for it you need fear no dissatisfaction on his part however epicurean may be his tastes should your cupboard be bare of aught more substantial than crackers and cheese do not yield to dismay split the crackers if splittable toast the inside lightly and butter while hot grate your cheese into a powdery mound garnishing the edges of the plate if you have no beverage except water to set before him let this be cool and pour it out for him yourself into an irreproachable glass a dirty tablecloth a smeared goblet or a sticky plate will spoil the most luxurious feast a table well set is half spread i have not said one tenth of that which is pressing upon my heart and mind yet i fear you may think me trite and tedious one suggestion more and we will proceed to the details of business i believe that so far as i can avail in securing such a result my receipts are accurate but in the matter of seasoning and other minor details consult your judgment and john's taste take this liberty with whatever receipt you think you can improve if i chance to find in your work-basket or upon the kitchen dresser a well-thumbed copy of my beloved common sense with copious annotations in the margin i shall so far from feeling wounded be flattered in having so diligent a student and with your permission shall engraft the most happy suggestions upon the next edition for the speedy issue of which the petitioner doth humbly pray marion harland note in looking over this book the reader will notice certain receipts marked thus i do not claim for these greater merit than should of right be accorded to many others i merely wish to call the attention of the novice to them as certainly safe and for the most part simple every one thus marked has been tried by myself most of them are in frequent some and daily use in my own family my reason for thus singling out comparatively a small number of receipts from the rest is the recollection of my own perplexities the loss of time and patience to which i have been subjected in the examination of a new cookery book with an eye to immediate use of the directions laid down for various dishes i have often and vainly wished for a finger-board to guide me in my search for those which were easy and sure and which would result satisfactorily this sort of directory i have endeavoured to supply taking care however to inform the reader in advance that so far as i know there is not an unsafe receipt in the whole work of course it was not necessary or expedient to append the above sign to plain roast and boiled which are in common use everywhere end of section two recording by phone Section 3 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Velma Karras, Chico, California, 2018. Common Sense in the Household. A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harland Soups The base of your soup should always be uncooked meat. To this may be added, if you like, cracked bones of cooked game or of underdone beef or mutton, but for flavor and nourishment depend upon the juices of the meat which was put in raw. Cut this into small pieces and beat the bone until it is fractured at every inch of its length. Put them on in cold water without salt and heat very slowly. Do not boil fast at any stage of the operation. Keep the pot covered and do not add the salt until the meat is thoroughly done as it has a tendency to harden the fibers and restrain the flow of the juices strain always through a colander 
after which clear soups should be filtered through a hair sieve or coarse bobbinet lace. The bag should not be squeezed. It is slovenly to leave rags of meat, husks of vegetables, and bits of bone in the tureen. Do not uncover until you are ready to ladle out the soup. Do this neatly and quickly, having your soup plates heated beforehand. Most soups are better the second day than the first, unless they are warmed over too quickly or left too long upon the fire after they are hot. In the one case, they are apt to scorch. In the other, they become insipid. Vegetable Soups Green Pea Number 1 4 pounds beef, cut into small pieces, 1 half peck of green peas, 1 gallon water, 1 half cup of rice flour, salt, pepper, and chopped parsley. Boil the empty pods of peas in the water one hour before putting in the beef. Strain them out, add the beef, and boil slowly for an hour and a half longer. Half an hour before serving, add the shelled peas, and twenty minutes later, the rice flour with salt, pepper, and parsley. After adding the rice flour, stir frequently to prevent scorching. Strain into a hot tureen. Green pea, number two. Two quarts of strong veal or beef broth. One half teaspoonful sugar. One tablespoonful butter. One quart shelled peas. Bring the broth to a boil. Put in the peas and boil for 20 minutes. Add the sugar and a sprig of green mint. Boil a quarter of an hour more and stir in the butter with pepper and salt, if the broth be not sufficiently salted already. Strain before serving, and send to table with small squares of toasted bread floating upon the top. Split pea, dried. One gallon water. One quart split peas, which have been soaked overnight. One pound salt pork, cut into bits an inch square. One pound beef, cut into bits an inch square. Celery and sweet herbs. Fried bread. Put over the fire and boil slowly for two hours, or until the quantity of liquor does not exceed two quarts. Pour into a colander and press the peas through with a wooden or silver spoon. Return the soup to the pot, adding a small head of celery, chopped up, a little parsley, or, if preferred, summer savory or sweet marjoram. Have ready three or four slices of bread, stale, which have been fried in butter until they are brown. Cut into slices and scatter them upon the surface of the soup after it is poured into the tureen. Pea and Tomato This is made according to either of the foregoing receipts. In summer, with green, in winter, with dried and split peas. Just before straining the soup, add a quart of tomatoes, which have already been stewed soft. Let the whole come to a good boil, and strain as above directed. If the stewed tomato be watery, strain off the superfluous liquid before pouring into the pea soup, or it will be too thin. Bean Dried The beans used for this purpose may be the ordinary kidney, the rice, or field bean, or, best of all, the French mock turtle soup bean. Soak a quart of these overnight in soft, lukewarm water. Put them over the fire next morning with one gallon of cold water and about two pounds of salt pork. Boil slowly for three hours, keeping the pot well covered. Shred into it a head of celery. Add pepper. Cayenne, if preferred. Simmer half an hour longer. Strain through a colander, and serve, with slices of lemon passed to each guest. Mock turtle beans, treated in this way, yield a very fair substitute for the fine calf's head soup known by the same name. Bean and Corn 
This is a winter soup, and is made of white beans prepared according to the foregoing receipt, but with the addition of a quart of dried or canned corn. If the former is used, and the shaker sweet corn is nearly salted corn quite as good for the purpose as the more expensive canned green corn, soak it overnight in warm water, changing this early in the morning and pouring on more warm water, barely enough to cover the corn, and keep it in a closed vessel until ready to put on the beans. Let all boil together, with pork as in the bean soup proper. Strain out as usual, rubbing hard through the colander. Some persons have a habit of neglecting the use of the colander in making bean soup, and serving it like stewed beans, which have been imperfectly drained. The practice is both slovenly and unwholesome, since the husks of the cereal are thus imposed upon the digestive organs of the eater with no additional nutriment. To the beans and corn may be added a pint of stewed tomato, if desired. Asparagus, white soup. Three pounds veal, the knuckle is best. Three bunches asparagus, as well bleached as you can procure. One gallon water. One cup milk. One tablespoonful rice flour. Pepper and salt. Cut off the hard green stem, and put half of the tender heads of the asparagus into the water with the meat. Boil in closely covered pot for three hours until the meat is in rags and the asparagus dissolved. Strain the liquor and return to the pot with the remaining half of asparagus heads. Let this boil for twenty minutes more and add, before taking up, a cup of sweet milk, cream is better, in which has been stirred a tablespoonful of rice flour, arrowroot, or cornstarch. When it has fairly boiled up, serve without further straining, with small squares of toast in the tureen. Season with salt and pepper. Asparagus, green soup. Three pounds veal, cut into small pieces. One half pound salt pork. Three bunches asparagus. One gallon water. Cut the entire stalk of the asparagus into pieces an inch long, and when the meat has boiled one hour, add half of the vegetable to the liquor in the pot. Boil two hours longer, and strain, pressing the asparagus pulp very hard to extract all the green coloring. Add the other half of the asparagus, the heads only, which should be kept in cold water until you are ready for them, and boil twenty minutes more. Then proceed as with the asparagus white soup, omitting the milk, thickening, and salt. The pork will supply the latter seasoning. Tomato, winter soup. Three pounds beef, one quart canned tomatoes, one gallon water, a little onion, pepper and salt. Let the meat and water boil for two hours until the liquid is reduced to little more than two quarts. Then stir in the tomatoes, and stew all slowly for three quarters of an hour longer. Season to taste, strain, and serve. Tomato, summer soup, two and a half pounds veal or lamb, one gallon water, two quarts fresh tomatoes, peeled and cut up fine, one tablespoon butter, one teaspoonful white sugar, pepper and salt, chopped parsley. Boil the meat to shreds and the water down to two quarts. Strain the liquor, put in the tomatoes, stirring them very hard that they may dissolve thoroughly. Boil half an hour. Season with parsley or any other green herb you may prefer pepper and salt. Strain again, and stir in a tablespoonful of butter, with a teaspoonful of white sugar, before pouring into the tureen. This soup is more palatable still, if made with the broth in which chickens were boiled for yesterday's dinner. Turnip. Knuckle of veal, well cracked, five quarts water.
cover closely and stew gently for four hours the day before the soup is wanted on the morrow skim off the fat and warm the stock gradually to a boil have ready an onion and six large winter or a dozen small summer turnips sweet marjoram or thyme minced very finely put these into the soup and let them simmer together for an hour strain return to the fire and add a cup of milk in which has been stirred a tablespoonful of rice flour or other thickening and a tablespoonful of butter season with salt and pepper let it boil up once stirring all the time as is necessary in all soups where milk is added at last and remove instantly or it will scorch potato a dozen large mealy potatoes two onions one pound salt pork three quarts water one tablespoonful butter one cup milk or cream one well-beaten egg chopped onion boil the pork in the clear water for an hour and a half then take it out have ready the potatoes which after being peeled and sliced should lie in cold water for half an hour throw them into the pot with the chopped onion cover and boil three quarters of an hour stirring often beat in butter milk and egg add the latter ingredients carefully a little at a time stir while it heats to a final boil and then serve this is a cheap wholesome dish and more palatable than one would suppose from reading the receipt graham soup three onions three carrots four turnips one small cabbage one bunch celery one pint stewed tomatoes chop all the vegetables except the tomatoes and cabbage very finely and set them over the fire with rather over three quarts of water they should simmer gently for half an hour at the end of which time the cabbage must be added having previously been parboiled and chopped up in fifteen minutes more put in the tomatoes and a bunch of sweet herbs and give all a lively boil for twenty minutes rub through a colander return the soup to the fire stir in a good tablespoonful of butter pepper and salt half a cup of cream if you have it thickened with cornstarch let it boil up and it is ready for the table okra or gumbo okra or okra with a k is a vegetable little known except in the far south where it is cultivated in large quantities and is very popular a favorite soup is prepared from it in the following manner two quarts of okras sliced thin one quart of tomatoes also sliced four tablespoonfuls of butter two pounds of beef cut into small pieces one half pound corned ham or pork also cut up put the meat and okras together in a pot with a quart of cold water just enough to cover them and let them stew for an hour then add the tomatoes and two quarts of boiling water more if the liquid in the pot has boiled away so as to expose the meat and vegetables boil three quarters of an hour longer skimming often with a silver spoon when the contents of the vessel are boiled to pieces put in the butter with cayenne pepper and salt if the ham has not seasoned it sufficiently strain and send up with squares of light crisp toast floating upon it corn one large fowl cut into eight pieces one dozen ears green corn cut from the cobs boil the chicken with the cobs in a gallon of water until the fowl is tender if tough the boiling must be slow and long then put the corn into the pot and stew an hour longer still gently remove the chicken with a cup full of the liquid if you wish to make other use of the meat set this aside take out the cobs season the corn soup with pepper salt and parsley 
thicken with rice or wheat flour, boil up once, and serve without straining, if the corn be young and tender. A tolerable fricassee may be made of the chicken, unless it has boiled to rags, by beating up an egg and a tablespoonful of butter, adding this to the cupful of reserved liquor from which the corn must be strained. Boil this for a moment, thicken with flour, throw in a little chopped parsley, pepper, and salt. Pour, while scalding, over the chicken, which you have arranged in a dish. Garnish with circular slices of hard-boiled eggs and curled parsley. End of section 3 Section 4 of Common Sense in the Household This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Velma Karras, Chico, California, 2018 Common Sense in the Household, A Manual of Practical Housewifery By Marian Harland Meat Soups Beef Soup A la Julienne Six pounds of lean beef. The shin is a good piece for this purpose. Have the bones well cracked, carefully extracting the marrow, every bit of which should be put into the soup. Six quarts of water. The stock must be prepared the day before the soup is needed. Put the beef, bones and all, with the water, in a closed vessel, and set it where it will heat gradually. Let it boil very slowly for six hours at least, only uncovering the pot once in a great while to see if there is a danger of the water sinking too rapidly. Should this be the case, replenish with boiling water, taking care not to put in too much. During the seventh hour, take off the soup and set it away in a cool place until next morning. About an hour before dinner, take out the meat, which you can use for mincemeat if you wish. Remove the cake of fat from the surface of the stock, set the soup over the fire, and throw in a little salt to bring up the scum. When this has been skimmed carefully off, put in your vegetables. These should be 2 carrots, 3 turnips, half a head of white cabbage, 1 pint green corn, or dried shaker corn soaked overnight, 1 head celery, 1 quart tomatoes. These should be prepared for the soup by slicing them very small and stewing them in barely enough water to cover them, until they break to pieces. Cook the cabbage by itself in two waters, throwing the first away. The only exception to the general dissolution is in the case of a single carrot, which should likewise be cooked alone and whole until thoroughly done, and set aside to cool when the rest of the vegetables, with the water in which they are boiled, are added to the soup. Return the pot to the fire with the vegetables and stock, and boil slowly for half an hour from the time ebullition actually begins. Strain without pressing, only shaking and lightly stirring the contents of the colander. The vegetables, having been added with all their juices already cooked, much boiling and squeezing are not needed, and only make the soup cloudy. Cut the reserved carrot into dice and drop into the clear liquor after it is in the tureen. Also, if you like, a handful of vermicelli, or macaroni which has been boiled tender in clear water. The seasoning of this excellent soup is a matter of taste. Some use only salt and white pepper. Others like, with this, a few blades of mace, and boil in the stock a handful of sweet herbs. And others fancy that, in addition to these, a glass of brown sherry imparts a flavor that renders it peculiarly acceptable to most palates. Send to table very hot, and have the soup plates likewise heated. Veal Soup with Macaroni Three pounds of veal knuckle or scrag, with the bones broken and meat cut up. Three quarts water. One quarter pound Italian macaroni. 
Boil the meat alone in the water for nearly three hours until it is reduced to shreds, and the macaroni until tender, in enough water to cover it, in a vessel by itself. The pieces should not be more than an inch in length. Add a little butter to the macaroni when nearly done. Strain the meat out of the soup, season to your taste, put in the macaroni and the water in which it was boiled, let it boil up, and serve. You can make macaroni soup of this by boiling a pound, instead of a quarter of a pound, in the second vessel, and adding the above quantity of veal broth. In this case, send on with a plate of grated cheese, that those who cannot relish macaroni without this accompaniment may put it into their soup. Take care that the macaroni is of uniform length, not too long, and that it does not break while stewing. Add butter in proportion to the increased quantity of macaroni. Beef Soup Brown 3 pounds beef cut into strips, 3 onions, 3 quarts water. Put beef and water into the saucepan and boil for one hour. Meanwhile, slice the onions and fry them in butter to a light brown. Drop into the pot with a teaspoon of cloves, half as much pepper, same quantity of mace's pepper, a pinch of allspice, and a teaspoonful of essence of celery, if you cannot get a head of fresh celery. Also, a half a teaspoon of powdered savory or sweet marjoram, and a teaspoonful of Worcestershire sauce. Stew all for two hours more, or until the beef has boiled to pieces. Strain the soup and return to the fire. Salt to taste, and just before taking it off, pour in a glass of brown sherry or Madeira wine. Mutton or Lamb Broth 4 pounds mutton or lamb Lean Cut into small pieces 1 gallon water 1 half teacup full rice Boil the unsalted meat for 2 hours, slowly, in a cooked vessel. Soak the rice in enough warm water to cover it, and at the end of this time, add it, water and all, to the boiling soup. Cook an hour longer stirring watchfully from time to time, lest the rice should settle and adhere to the bottom of the pot. Beat an egg to a froth and stir into a cup of cold milk, into which has been rubbed smoothly a tablespoonful rice or wheat flour. Mix with this, a little at a time, some of the scalding liquor, until the egg is so far cooked that there is no danger of curdling in the soup. Pour into the pot, when you have taken out the meat, season with parsley, thyme, pepper, and salt. Boil up fairly and serve. If allowed to stand on the fire, it is apt to burn. This soup may be made from the liquor in which a leg of mutton has been boiled, provided too much salt was not put in with it. It is especially good when the stock is chicken broth. For the sick, it is palatable and nutritious with the rice left in. When strained, it makes a nice white table soup, and is usually relished by all. Vermicelli Soup 4 pounds lamb, from which every particle of fat has been removed. 1 pound veal A slice of corned ham 5 quarts water Cut up the meat, cover it with a quart of water, and set it back on the range to heat very gradually, keeping it covered closely. At the end of an hour, add four quarts of boiling water and cook until the meat is in shreds. Season with salt, sweet herbs, a chopped shallot, two teaspoonfuls of Worcestershire sauce, and when these have boiled in the soup for ten minutes, strain and return to the fire. Have ready about a third of a pound of vermicelli, or macaroni, which has been boiled tender in clear water. Add this, boil up once, and pour out. Mock Turtle, or Calf's Head Soup One large calf's head, well cleaned and washed. Four pig's feet, well cleaned and washed. This soup should always be prepared the day before it is to be served up. Lay the head and feet in the bottom of a large pot, and cover with a gallon of water. Let it boil three hours, or until the flesh will slip easily from the bones. 
Take out the head, leaving in the feet, and allow these to boil steadily while you cut the meat from the head. Select with care enough of the fatty portions which lie on the top of the head and the cheeks to fill a teacup, and set them aside to cool. Remove the brains to a saucer, and also set aside. Cut the rest of the meat with the tongue very fine. Season with salt, pepper, powdered marjoram, and thyme. A teaspoonful of cloves, the same of mace, half as much allspice, and a grated nutmeg, and return to the pot. When the flesh falls from the bones of the pig's feet, take out the latter, leaving it in the gelatinous meat. Let all boil together slowly, without removing the cover, for two hours more. Take the soup from the fire and set it away until the next day. An hour before dinner, set on the stock to warm. When it boils, strain carefully and drop in the meat you have reserved, which, when cold, should be cut into small squares. Have these all ready as well as the force meat balls. To prepare these, rub the yolks of five hard-boiled eggs to a paste in wedgewood mortar or in a bowl with the back of a silver tablespoon, adding gradually the brains to moisten them, also a little butter and salt. Mix with these two eggs beaten very light, flour your hands, and make this paste into balls about the size of a pigeon's egg. Throw them into the soup five minutes before you take it from the fire. Stir in three large tablespoonfuls of browned flour, rubbed smooth in three great spoonfuls of melted butter. Let it boil up well, and finish the seasoning by the addition of a glass and a half of good wine, sherry or Madeira, and the juice of a lemon. It should not boil more than half an hour on the second day. Serve with sliced lemon. Some lay the slices upon the top of the soup, but the better plan is to pass to the guest a small dish containing these. If the directions be closely followed, the result is sure to be satisfactory, and the task is really much less troublesome than it appears to be. Giblet Soup Feet, neck, pinions, and giblets of three chickens, or of two ducks, or two geese. One and a half pound veal. Half pound ham. 3 quarts water. Crack the bones into small pieces, and cut the meat into strips. Put all together with the giblets over the fire, with a bunch of sweet herbs and a pinch of allspice. Stew slowly for two hours. Take out the giblets and set them aside in a pan where they will keep warm. Take up a teacup full of hot soup, and stir into this a large tablespoonful of flour which has been wet with cold water, and rubbed to a smooth paste. Then, two tablespoonfuls of butter. Return to the pot and boil for 15 minutes. Season at the last with a glass of brown sherry and a tablespoonful of tomato or walnut catsup. A little Worcestershire sauce is an improvement. Finally, chop and add the giblets and boil up once. Brown gravy soup. Three pounds beef, one carrot, one turnip, one head of celery, six onions if small button onions, one if large, three and a half quarts water. Have ready some nice drippings in a frying pan. Slice the onions and fry them brown. Take them out and set them by in a covered pan to keep warm. Cut the beef into bits, an inch long and half an inch thick, and fry them brown also, turning frequently lest they should burn. Chop the vegetables and put them with the meat and onions into a covered pot. Pour on the water and let all stew together for two hours. Then throw in salt and pepper and boil one hour longer, skimming very carefully. Strain. Put back over the fire. Boil up once more to make the liquid perfectly clear. Skim and add a handful of vermicelli that has been boiled separately and drained dry. The safest plan is to put in the vermicelli after the soup is poured into the tureen. Do not stir before it goes to table. The contents of the tureen should be clear as amber. Some add half a glass of pale sherry. This is a fine show soup, and very popular. Veal and Sago Soup Two and a half pounds veal chopped fine. One quarter pound pearl sago. One pint milk. Four eggs. 
3 quarts water. Put on the veal in water and boil slowly until the liquid is reduced to about one half of the original quantity. Strain out the shreds of meat and put the soup again over the fire. Meanwhile, the sago should be washed in several waters and soaked half an hour in warm water enough to cover it. Stir it into the strained broth and boil, stirring very often to prevent lumping or scorching, half an hour more. Heat the milk almost to boiling. Beat the yolks of the eggs very light. Mix with the milk gradually, as in making boiled custard and pour, stirring all the while, into the soup. Season with pepper and salt. Boil up once to cook the eggs and serve. Should the liquid be too thick after putting in the eggs, replenish with boiling water. It should be about the consistency of hot custard. This soup is very good if chicken broth be substituted for the veal. It is very strengthening to invalids and especially beneficial to those suffering from colds and pulmonary affections. Chicken Soup Two young fowls, or one full grown, one half pound corn ham, one gallon of water. Cut the fowls into pieces as for fricassee. Put these with the ham into the pot with a quart of water, or enough to cover them fairly. Stew for an hour if the fowls are tender, if tough, until you can cut easily into the breast. Take out the breasts, leaving the rest of the meat in the pot, and add the remainder of the water, boiling hot. Keep the soup stewing slowly while you chop up the white meat you have selected. Rub the yolks of four hard-boiled eggs smooth in a mortar or bowl, moistening to a paste with a few spoonfuls of the soup. Mix with these a handful of fine breadcrumbs and the chopped meat, and make it into small balls. When the soup has boiled in all, two hours and a half, if the chicken be reduced to shreds, strain out the meat and bones. Season with salt and white pepper with a bunch of chopped parsley. Drop in the prepared forcemeat, and after boiling 10 minutes to incorporate the ingredients well, add, a little at a time, a pint of rich milk thickened with flour. Boil up once and serve. A chicken at least a year old would make better soup than a younger fowl. Venison Soup 3 pounds of venison, what are considered the inferior pieces, will do. 1 pound corned ham or salt pork. 1 onion. 1 head of celery. Cut the meat. Chop the vegetables and put on with just enough water to cover them, keeping on the lid of the pot all the while, and stew slowly for 1 hour. Then add 2 quarts of boiling water, with a few blades of mace and a dozen whole peppers. Or should you prefer, a little cayenne. Boil 2 hours longer, salt, and strain. Return the liquor to the pot. Stir in a tablespoonful of butter, thicken with a tablespoonful of browned flour, wet into a smooth thin paste with cold water. Add a tablespoonful of walnut or mushroom catsup, a teaspoonful of Worcestershire sauce or other pungent sauce, and a generous glass of Madeira or brown sherry. Hare or Rabbit Soup Dissect the rabbit, crack the bones, and prepare precisely as you would the venison soup, only putting in three small onions instead of one, and a bunch of sweet herbs. Hares which are too tough to be cooked in any other way make excellent game soup. Also, the large gray squirrel of the Middle and Southern States. Oxtail Soup One oxtail Two pounds lean beef Four carrots Three onions Time. Cut the tail into several pieces and fry brown in butter. Slice the onions and two carrots, and when you remove the ox tail from the frying pan, put in these and brown them also. When done, tie them in a bag with a bunch of thyme and drop into the soup pot. Lay the pieces of ox tail in the same, then the meat cut into small slices. Grate over them the two whole carrots and add four quarts of cold water with pepper and salt. Boil for four to six hours, in proportion to the size of the tail. Strain fifteen minutes before serving it, and thicken with two tablespoons of brown flour. Boil ten minutes longer. End of section four.
Section 5 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Velma Karras, Chico, California, 2018. Common Sense in the Household A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harland. Fish Soups. Oyster Soup, Number 1. Two quarts of oysters, one quart of milk, two tablespoonfuls butter, one teacup full water. Strain the liquor from the oysters, add to it the water, and set it over the fire to heat slowly in a covered vessel. When it is near boiling, season with pepper and salt. Add the oysters and let them stew until they ruffle on the edges. This will be in about five minutes. Then put in the butter with the milk which has been heated in a separate vessel and stir well for two minutes. Serve with sliced lemon and oyster or cream crackers. Some use mace and nutmeg in seasoning. The crowning excellence in oyster soup is to have it cooked just enough. Too much stewing ruins the bivalves, while an undertone oyster is a flabby abomination. The plumpness of the main body and ruffled edge are good indices of their right condition. Oyster Soup Number 2 2 quarts of oysters, 2 eggs, 1 quart of milk, 1 teacup full of water. Strain the liquor from the oysters into a saucepan. Pour in with it the water. Season with cayenne pepper and a little salt, a teaspoonful of mingled nutmeg, mace, and cloves. When the liquor is almost boiling, add half the oysters chopped finely and boil five minutes quite briskly. Strain the soup and return to saucepan. Have ready some force meat balls, not larger than marbles, made of the yolks of eggs, boiled hard and rubbed to a smooth paste with a little butter, then mix with six raw oysters chopped very finely, a little salt, and a raw egg well beaten to bind the ingredients together. Flour your hands well, and roll the force meat into pellets, laying them upon a cold plate, so as not to touch one another until needed. Then put the reserved whole oysters in the hot soup, and when it begins to boil again, drop in the force meat marbles. Boil until the oysters ruffle, by which time the balls will also be done. Add the hot milk. Serve with sliced lemon and crackers. A liberal tablespoonful of butter, stirred in gently at the last, is an improvement. Clam Soup 50 clams 1 quart milk 1 pint water 2 tablespoonfuls butter Drain off the liquor from the clams and put it over the fire with a dozen whole peppers, a few bits of cayenne pods, half a dozen blades of mace, and salt to taste. Let it boil for ten minutes. Then put in the clams and boil half an hour quite fast, keeping the pot closely covered. If you dislike to see the whole spices in the tureen, strain them out before the clams are added. At the end of the half hour, add the milk, which has been heated to scalding, not boiling, in another vessel. Boil up again, taking care the soup does not burn, and put in the butter. Then serve without delay. If you desire a thicker soup, stir a heaping tablespoonful of rice flour into a little cold milk and put in with a quart of hot. Catfish Soup Those who have only seen the bloated, unsightly horn pouts that play the scavengers about city wharves are excusable for entertaining a prejudice against them as an article of food. But the small catfish of our inland lakes and streams are altogether respectable except in their unfortunate name. Six catfish. In average weight, half a pound apiece. One half pound salt pork. One pint milk. Two eggs. One head of celery. Or a small bag of celery seed. Skin and clean the fish and cut them up. Chop the pork into small pieces. Put these together into the pot with two quarts of water, chopped sweet herbs, and the celery seasoning. Boil for an hour, or until the fish and pork are in rags, and strain, if you desire a regular soup for a first course. Return to the saucepan and add the milk, which should be already hot. 
next the eggs beaten to a froth and a lump of butter the size of a walnut boil up once and serve with dice of toasted bread on top pass sliced lemon or walnut or butternut pickles with it eel soup eel soup is made in precisely the same manner as catfish only boiled longer a chopped onion is no detriment to the flavor of either and will remove the muddy taste with which these fish sometimes acquire from turbid streams lobster soup two quarts veal or chicken broth well strained one large lobster two eggs boiled hard boil the lobster and extract the meat setting aside the coral in a cool place cut or chop up the meat found in the claws rub the yolks of the eggs to a paste with a teaspoonful of butter pound and rub the claw meat in the same manner and mix with the yolks beat up a raw egg and stir into the paste season with pepper salt and if you like mace make into force meat balls and set away with the coral to cool and harden by this time the stock should be well heated when put in the rest of the lobster meat cut into square bits boil fifteen minutes which time employ in pounding the coral in a wedgewood mortar or earthenware bowl rubbing it into a fine even paste with the addition of a few spoonfuls of the broth gradually worked in until it is about the consistency of boiled starch stir very carefully into the hot soup which should in the process blush into a rosate hue lastly drop in the force meat balls after which do not stir lest they should break simmer a few minutes to cook the raw egg but if allowed to boil the soup will darken crab soups may be made in the same way excepting the coralline process crabs being destitute of that daintity green turtle soup a glass of madeira two onions bunch of sweet herbs juice of one lemon five quarts of water chop up the coarser parts of the turtle meat with the entrails and bones add to them four quarts of water and stew four hours with herbs onions pepper and salt stew very slowly but do not let it cease to boil during this time at the end of the four hours strain the soup and add the finer parts of the turtle and the green fat which has been simmered for one hour in two quarts of water thicken with brown flour return to the soup pot and simmer gently an hour longer if there are eggs in the turtle boil them in a separate vessel for four hours and throw into the soup before making it up if not put in force meat balls then the juice of the lemon and the wine beat up once and pour out some cooks add the finer meat before straining boiling altogether five hours then strain thicken and put in the green fat cut into lumps an inch long this makes a handsomer soup than if the meat is left in for the mock eggs take the yolk of three hard-boiled eggs and one raw egg well beaten rub the boiled eggs into a paste with a teaspoonful of butter bind with the raw egg roll into pellets the size and shape of turtle eggs and lay in boiling water for two minutes before dropping into the soup force meat balls for the above six tablespoonfuls turtle meat chopped very fine rub to a paste with the yolks of two hard-boiled eggs tablespoonful of butter and if convenient a little oyster liquor season with cayenne mace and half a teaspoonful of white sugar bind with a well-beaten egg shape into balls dip in egg then powdered cracker fry in butter and drop into the soup when it is served green turtle for soups is now within the reach of every private family being well preserved in airtight cans end of section five section six of common sense in the household this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Common Sense in the Household, A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harlan. Fish 
boiled codfish fresh lay the fish in cold water slightly salted for half an hour before it is time to cook it when it has been wiped free of the salt and water wrap it in a clean linen cloth kept for such purposes the cloth should be dredged with flour to prevent sticking sew up the edges in such a manner as to envelop the fish entirely yet have but one thickness of the cloth over any part the wrapping should be fitted neatly to the shape of the piece to be cooked put into the fish kettle pour on plenty of hot water and boil briskly fifteen minutes for each pound have ready a sauce prepared thus to one gill boiling water add as much milk and when it is scalding hot stir in leaving the saucepan on the fire two tablespoonfuls of butter rolled thickly in flour as this thickens two beaten eggs season with salt and chopped parsley and when after one good boil you withdraw it from the fire add a dozen capers or pickled nasturtium seeds or if you prefer a spoonful of vinegar in which celery seeds have been steeped put the fish into a hot dish and pour the sauce over it some serve in a butter boat but i fancy that the boiling sauce applied to the steaming fish imparts a richness it cannot gain later garnish with sprigs of parsley and circles of hard-boiled eggs laid around the edge of the dish rockfish rockfish and river bass are very nice cooked as above but do not need to be boiled so long as codfish boiled codfish salt put the fish to soak overnight in lukewarm water as early as eight o'clock in the evening change this for more warm water at bedtime and cover closely change again in the morning and wash off the salt two hours before dinner plunge into very cold water this makes it firm finally set over the fire with enough lukewarm water to cover it and boil for half an hour drain well lay it on a hot dish and pour over it egg sauce prepared as in the foregoing receipt only substituting the yolks of two hard-boiled eggs rubbed to a paste with butter for the beaten raw egg this is a useful receipt for country housekeepers who can seldom procure fresh cod salt mackerel prepared in the same way will repay the care and time required so superior is it to the friday's dish of salt fish as usually served should the cold fish left over be used for fish balls as it should be it will be found that the sauce which is soaked into it while hot has greatly improved it codfish balls prepare the fish precisely as for boiling whole cut in pieces when it has been duly washed and soaked and boil twenty minutes turn off the water and cover with fresh from the boiling tea kettle boil twenty minutes more drain the fish very dry and spread upon a dish to cool when perfectly cold pick to pieces with a fork removing every vestige of skin and bone and shredding very fine when this is done add an equal bulk of mashed potato work into a stiff batter by adding a lump of butter and sweet milk and if you want to have them very nice a beaten egg flour your hands and make the mixture into balls or cakes drop them into boiling lard or good dripping and fry to a light brown plainer fish cakes may be made of the cod and potatoes alone molded round like biscuit in any shape the dish is popular salt codfish stewed with eggs prepare the fish as for balls heat almost to boiling a pint of rich sweet milk and stir into it gradually and carefully three eggs well beaten a tablespoonful of butter a little chopped parsley and butter with pepper lastly the fish boil up once and turn into a deep covered dish or chafing dish lined with buttered toast eat hot for breakfast or supper codfish and potato stew soak boil and pick the fish if salt as for fish balls if fresh boil and pick into bits add an equal quantity of mashed potatoes a large tablespoonful of butter and milk enough to make it very soft put into a skillet and add a little boiling water to keep it from burning turn and toss constantly until it is smoking hot but not dry add pepper and parsley and dish boiled mackerel fresh clean the mackerel and wipe carefully with a dry clean cloth wash them lightly with another cloth dipped in vinegar wrap each in a coarse linen cloth floured basted closely to the shape of the fish put them into a pot with enough salted water to cover them 
and boil them gently for three quarters of an hour drain them well take a teacupful of the water in which they were boiled and put into a saucepan with a tablespoonful of walnut ketchup some anchovy paste or sauce and the juice of half a lemon let this boil up well and add a lump of butter the size of an egg with a tablespoonful browned flour wet in cold water boil up again and serve in the sauce boat this makes a brown sauce you can substitute egg sauce if you like garnish with parsley and nasturtium blossoms broiled mackerel fresh clean the mackerel wash and wipe dry split it open so that when laid flat the backbone will be in the middle sprinkle lightly with salt and lay on a buttered gridiron over a clear fire with the inside downward until it begins to brown then turn the other when quite done lay on a hot dish and butter it plentifully turn another hot dish over the lower one and let it stand two or three minutes before sending to table broiled mackerel salt soak overnight in lukewarm water change this early in the morning for very cold and let the fish lie in this until time to cook then proceed as with the fresh mackerel boiled halibut lay in cold salt and water for an hour wipe dry and score the skin in squares put into the kettle with cold salted water enough to cover it it is so firm in texture that you can boil without a cloth if you choose let it heat gradually and boil from half to three quarters of an hour in proportion to the size of the piece four or five pounds will be enough for most private families drain and accompany by egg sauce either poured over the fish or in a sauce boat save the cold remnants of the fish and what sauce is left until next morning pick out as you would cod mix with an equal quantity of mashed potato moisten with the sauce or with milk and butter if you have no sauce put it into a skillet and stir until it is very hot do not burn season with pepper and salt baked halibut take a piece of halibut weighing five or six pounds and lay in salt and water for two hours wipe dry and score the outer skin set in the baking pan in a tolerably hot oven and bake an hour basting often with butter and water heated together in a saucepan or tin cup when a fork will penetrate it easily it is done it should be of a fine brown take the gravy in the dripping pan add a little boiling water should there not be enough stir in a tablespoonful of walnut ketchup a teaspoonful of worcestershire sauce the juice of a lemon and thicken with brown flour previously wet with cold water boil up once and put into sauce boat there is no finer preparation of halibut than this which is however comparatively little known those who have eaten it usually prefer it to be boiled and broiled you can use what is left for the same purpose as the fragments of boiled halibut halibut steak wash and wipe the steaks dry beat up two or three eggs and roll out some boston or other brittle crackers upon the kneading board until they are fine as dust dip each steak into the beaten egg then into the bread crumbs when you have salted the fish and fry in hot fat lard or nice dripping or you can broil the steak upon a buttered gridiron over a clear fire for seasoning with salt and pepper when done lay in a hot dish butter well and cover closely deviled halibut mince a pound of cold boiled or baked halibut or the fragments of halibut steak and make for it the following dressing the yolks of three hard-boiled eggs rubbed smooth with the back of a silver spoon or in a wedgewood mortar and when there remain no lumps in it work into a soft paste with a tablespoonful salad oil next beat in two teaspoonfuls white sugar a teaspoonful made mustard a pinch of cayenne teaspoonful salt one of worcestershire sauce a little anchovy paste if you have it and finally a little at a time to prevent lumping a small teacupful of vinegar in which celery seed have been steeped it is easy to keep a bottle of this on hand for salads and sauces stir all thoroughly into the minced fish garnish with a chain of the whites of the eggs cut into rings with a small round slice of pickled beet laid within each link and you have a piquant and pretty salad for the supper table boiled salmon wrap the fish when you have washed and wiped it in a clean linen cloth not too thick 
baste it up securely and put into the fish kettle cover with cold water in which has been melted a handful of salt boil slowly allowing about a quarter of an hour to each pound when the time is up rip open a corner of the cloth and test the salmon with a fork if it penetrate easily it is done if not hastily pin up the cloth and cook a little longer skim off the scum as it rises to the top have ready in another saucepan a pint of cream or half milk and half cream will do which has been heated in a vessel set in boiling water stir into this a large spoonful of butter rolled in flour a little salt and chopped parsley and a half gill of the water in which the fish is boiled let it boil up once stirring all the while when the fish is done take it instantly from the kettle lay it in an instant upon a folded cloth to absorb the drippings transfer with great care for fear of breaking to a hot dish and pour the boiled cream over it reserving enough to fill a small sauce boat garnish with curled parsley and circular slices of hard-boiled yolks leaving out the whites of the eggs after serving boiled salmon with cream sauce you will never be quite content with any other if you cannot get cream boil a pint of milk and thicken with arrowroot it is not so nice but many will not detect the difference real cream being a rare commodity in town you may pickle what is left if it is in one piece or devil it as i have directed you to treat cold halibut or mince mixed with mashed potato milk and butter and stir into a sort of stew or once again mixed with mashed potato milk butter and a raw egg well beaten make into cakes or balls and fry in hot lard or dripping at any rate let none of it be lost it being at once one of our most expensive and most delicious fish baked salmon wash and wipe dry and rub with pepper and salt some add a soupçon of cayenne and powdered mace lay the fish upon a grating set over your baking pan and roast or bake basting it freely with butter and toward the last with its own drippings only should it brown too fast cover the top with a sheet of white paper until the whole is cooked when it is done transfer to a hot dish and cover closely and add to the gravy a little hot water thickened with arrowroot rice or wheat flour wet of course first with cold water a great spoonful of strained tomato sauce and the juice of a lemon boil up and serve in a sauce boat or you can serve with cream sauce made as for boiled salmon garnish handsomely with alternate sprigs of parsley and the bleached tops of celery with ruby bits of firm currant jelly here and there this is a fine dish for a dinner party a glass of sherry improves the first named sauce salmon steaks dry well with a cloth dredge with flour and lay them upon a well-buttered gridiron over clear hot coals turn with a broad bladed knife slipped beneath and a flat wire egg beater above lest the steak should break when done to a light brown lay in a hot dish butter each steak seasoning with salt and pepper cover closely and serve pickled salmon fresh having cleaned your fish cut into pieces of a convenient size to go into the fish kettle and boil in salted water as for the table drain it very dry wipe it with a clean cloth and set it aside in a cool place until next morning make pickle enough to cover it in the following proportions two quarts vinegar a dozen blades of mace dozen white peppers dozen cloves two teaspoonfuls made mustard three tablespoonfuls white sugar and a pint of the water in which the fish was boiled let them boil up once hard that you may skim the pickle should the spices come away with the scum in large quantities pick them out and return to the kettle set the liquor away in an earthenware jar closely covered to keep in the flavor next morning hang it over a brisk fire in a bell metal kettle covered and heat to boiling meanwhile prepare the salmon by cutting into pieces an inch and a half long and half an inch wide cut cleanly and regularly with a sharp knife when they are all ready and the liquor is on the boil drop them carefully into the kettle let the pickle boil up once to make sure the salmon is heated through have ready some air-tight glass jars such as you use for canning fruit and tomatoes take the salmon from the kettle while it is still on the stove or range with a wire egg beater 
taking care you do not break the pieces drop them rapidly into the jar packing closely as you go on fill with a boiling pickle until it overflows screw on the top and set away in a dark cool place proceed in the same way with each can until all are full salmon thus put up will keep good for years as i can testify from experience and will well repay the trouble of preparation you can vary the seasoning to your taste adding a shallot or two minced very fine some celery and small pods of cayenne pepper which always look well in vinegar be sure that the contents of the kettle are boiling when transferred to the cans that they are not allowed time to cool in the transit that the elastic on the can is properly adjusted and the top screwed down tightly and success is certain i would call the attention of those who are fond of the potted spiced salmon sold at a high price in grocery stores to this receipt for making the same luxury at home it costs less by one half is as good and is always on hand pickled salmon salt wash the salmon in two or three waters rubbing it lightly with a coarse cloth to remove the salt crystals then soak over night in tepid water exchange this in the morning for ice cold and let the fish lie in the latter for three hours take it out wipe dry and cut in strips as directed in the foregoing receipt drop these when all are ready in a saucepan of boiling water placed alongside of a kettle of pickle prepared as for fresh salmon beside these have your air-tight jars covers laid in readiness and when the salmon has boiled five minutes fairly boiled not simmered fish out the pieces with your wire spoon pack rapidly into your can fill up with the boiling pickle from the other kettle and seal instantly in two days the pickled salmon will be fit for use and is scarcely distinguishable from that made of fresh fish it has the advantage of being always procurable and of comparative cheapness and in the country is a valuable standby in case of unexpected supper company smoked salmon broiled take a piece of raw smoked salmon the size of your hand or larger in proportion to the number who are to sit down to supper wash it in two waters rubbing off the salt lay in a skillet with enough warm not hot water to cover it let it simmer fifteen minutes and boil five remove it wipe dry and lay on a buttered gridiron to broil when it is nicely browned on both sides transfer to a hot dish butter liberally and pepper to taste garnish with hillocks of grated horseradish interspersed with sprays of fresh or pickled fennel seed or with parsley raw smoked salmon is in common use upon the supper table cut into smooth strips as long as the middle finger and rather wider arranged neatly upon a garnish dish and eaten with pepper sauce or some other pungent condiment boiled shad fresh clean wash and wipe the fish a roe shad is best for this purpose cleanse the roes thoroughly and having sprinkled both shad and eggs with salt wrap in separate cloths and put into a fish kettle side by side cover with salted water and boil from half an hour to three quarters in proportion to the size experience is the best rule as to the time when you have once cooked fish to a turn note the weight and time and you will be at no loss thereafter a good rule is to make a penciled memorandum in the margin of the receipt book opposite certain receipts serve the shad upon a hot dish with a boat of drawn butter mingled with chopped eggs and parsley or egg sauce lay the rose about the body of the fish garnish with capers and slices of hard-boiled eggs boiled shad salt soak the fish six or seven hours in warm water changing it several times wipe off all the salt and immerse in ice-cold water when it has lain in this an hour put into a fish kettle with enough fresh water to cover it and boil from fifteen to twenty minutes in proportion to the size serve in a hot dish with a large lump of butter spread over the fish broiled shad fresh wash wipe and split the fish sprinkle with salt and pepper and lay it upon a buttered gridiron inside downward when the lower side is browned turn the fish one of medium size will be done in about twenty minutes serve upon a hot dish and lay a good piece of butter upon the fish broiled shad salt 
soak over night in lukewarm water take out in the morning and transfer to ice cold for half an hour wipe very dry and broil as you do fresh shad fried shad this is a popular dish upon southern tables and is good anywhere clean wash and wipe a fine roe shad split and cut each side into four pieces leaving out the head and removing fins and tail sprinkle with salt and pepper and dredge with flour have ready a frying pan of boiling hot lard or drippings put in the fish and fry brown turning at the end of five minutes to cook the other side fry the roe in the same way lay the fish in the middle of the dish and the roe outside of it garnish with watercresses and sprigs of pickled cauliflower and eat with ketchup baked shad clean wash and wipe the fish which should be a large one make a stuffing of grated brown crumbs butter salt pepper and sweet herbs stuff the shad and sew it up lay it in the baking pan with a cupful of water to keep it from burning and bake an hour basting with butter and water until it is tender throughout and well browned take it up put in a hot dish and cover tightly while you boil up the gravy with a great spoonful of ketchup a tablespoonful of brown flour which has been wet with cold water the juice of a lemon and if you want to have it very fine a glass of sherry or madeira garnish with sliced lemon and watercresses you may pour the gravy around the fish or serve in a sauce boat of course you take out the thread with which it has been sewed up before serving the fish boiled sea bass clean and put the fish into the fish kettle with salted water enough to cover it when you have enveloped it in the fish cloth a medium-sized fish will be done in a little over half an hour but do not boil too fast when done drain and serve in a hot dish lay sliced boiled eggs upon and about it and serve with egg sauce mingled with capers and nasturtium seed fried sea bass use smaller fish for this purpose than for boiling clean wipe dry inside and out dredge with flour and season with salt fry in hot butter or dripping a mixture half butter half lard is good for frying fish the bass should be done to a delicate brown not to a crisp the fashion affected by some cooks of drying fried fish to a crust is simply abominable fried bass are a most acceptable breakfast dish sturgeon steak skin the steaks carefully and lay in salted water cold for an hour to remove the oily taste so offensive to most palates then wipe each steak dry salt and broil over hot coals on a buttered gridiron serve in a hot dish when you have buttered and peppered them and send up garnish with parsley and accompanied by a small glass dish containing sliced lemon or you can pour over them a sauce prepared in this way put a tablespoonful of butter into a frying pan and stir until it is brown not burned add a half teacupful of boiling water in which has been stirred a tablespoonful of browned flour previously wet with cold water add salt a teaspoonful worcestershire sauce or anchovy the juice of a lemon and let it boil up well pour over the steaks when you have arranged them in the dish baked sturgeon a piece of sturgeon weighing five or six pounds is enough for a handsome dish skin it and let it stand in salt and water for half an hour parboil it to remove the oil make a dressing of bread crumbs minute bits of fat salt pork sweet herbs and butter gash the upper part of the fish quite deeply and rub this force meat well in put in a baking dish with a little water to keep it from burning and bake for an hour serve with a sauce of drawn butter in which has been stirred a spoonful of caper sauce and another of ketchup this is a virginia receipt and an admirable one mayonnaise fish take a pound or so of cold boiled fish halibut rock or cod cut not chop into pieces an inch in length mix in a bowl a dressing as follows the yolks of four boiled eggs rubbed to a smooth paste with salad oil add to these salt pepper mustard two teaspoonfuls white sugar and lastly six tablespoonfuls of vinegar beat the mixture until light and just before pouring it over the fish stir in lightly the frothed white of a raw egg serve the fish in a glass dish with half the dressing stirred in with it spread the remainder over the top 
and lay blanched lettuce leaves around the edges to be eaten with it baked salmon trout those who have eaten this prince of game fish in the adirondacks within an hour after he has left the lake will agree with me that he has never had such justice done him at any other time as when baked with cream handle the beauty with gentle respect while cleaning washing and wiping him and lay him at full length still respectfully in a baking pan with just enough water to keep him from scorching if large score the backbone with a sharp knife taking care not to mar the comeliness of his red spotted sides bake slowly basting often with butter and water by the time he is done and he should be so well looked after that his royal robe hardly shows a seam or rent and the red spots are still distinctly visible have ready in a saucepan a cup of cream diluted with a few tablespoonfuls of hot water lest it should clot in heating in which have been stirred cautiously two tablespoonfuls of melted butter and a little chopped parsley heat this in a vessel set within another of boiling water add the gravy from the dripping pan boil up once to thicken and when the trout is laid always respectfully in a hot dish pour the sauce around him as he lies in state he will take kindly to the creamy bath and your guests will take kindly to him garnish with a wreath of crimson nasturtium blooms and dainty sprigs of parsley arranged by your own hands on the edge of the dish and let no sharply spiced sauces come near him they would but mar his native richness the flavor he brought with him from the lake and wildwood salt him lightly should he need it eat and be happy if the above savor of bathos rather than common sense my excuse is i have lately eaten baked salmon trout with cream gravy boiled salmon trout clean wash and dry the trout envelop in a thin cloth fitted neatly to the shape of the fish lay within a fish kettle cover with salted water cold and boil gently half an hour or longer according to the size when done unwrap and lay in a hot dish pour around it cream sauce made as for baked salmon trout only of course with the omission of the fish gravy and serve fried trout brook trout are generally cooked in this way and form a rarely delightful breakfast or supper dish clean wash and dry the fish roll lightly in flour and fry in butter or clarified dripping or butter and lard let the fat be hot fry quickly to a delicate brown and take up the instant they are done lay for an instant upon a hot folded napkin to absorb whatever grease may cling to their speckled sides then range side by side in a heated dish garnish and send to the table use no seasoning except salt and that only when the fish are fried in lard or unsalted dripping fried pickerel the pickerel ranks next to trout among game fish and should be fried in the same manner especially and i urge this with groaning of spirit in remembrance of the many times in which i have had my sense of fitness not to say my appetite outraged by seeing the gallant fish brought to table dried to a crisp throughout all his juices wasted and sweetness utterly departed especially do not fry him slowly and too long and when he is done take him out of the grease cream pickerel reserve your largest pickerel those over three pounds in weight for baking and proceed with them as with baked salmon trout cream gravy and all if you cannot afford cream substitute rich milk and thicken with rice or wheat flour the fish are better cooked in this way than any other fried perch and other pan fish clean wash and dry the fish lay them in a large flat dish salt and dredge with flour have ready a frying pan of hot dripping lard or butter put in as many fish as the pan will hold without crowding and fry to a light brown send up hot in a chafing dish the many varieties of pan fish porgies flounders river bass weak fish white fish etc may be cooked in like manner in serving lay the head of each fish to the tail of the one next him stewed catfish skin clean and cut off the horribly homely heads sprinkle with salt to remove any muddy taste that may have contracted from the flats or holes in which they have fed and let them lie in a cool place for an hour or so then put them into a saucepan cover with cold water and stew very gently for half 
to three quarters of an hour according to their size add a chopped shallot or button onion a bunch of chopped parsley a little pepper a large tablespoonful of butter a tablespoonful of flour mixed to a paste with cold water boil up once take out the fish carefully and lay in a deep dish boil up the gravy once more and pour over the fish send to table in a covered dish fried catfish skin clean and remove the heads sprinkle with salt and lay aside for an hour or more have ready two or three eggs beaten to a froth and in a flat dish a quantity of powdered cracker dip the fish first in the egg then in the cracker and fry quickly in hot lard or dripping take up as quick as done catfish chowder skin clean and cut off the head cut the fish into pieces two inches long and put into a pot with some fat pork cut into shreds a pound to a dozen medium-sized fish two chopped onions or half a dozen shallots a bunch of sweet herbs and pepper the pork will salt it sufficiently stew slowly for three quarters of an hour then stir in a cup of milk thickened with a tablespoonful of flour take up a cupful of the hot liquor and stir a little at a time into two well-beaten eggs return this to the pot throw in half a dozen boston or butter crackers split in half let all boil up once and turn into a tureen pass sliced lemon or cucumber pickles also sliced with it take out the backbones of the fish before serving stewed eels inquire before buying where they were caught and give so decided a preference to country eels as to refuse those fattened upon the offal of city wharves nor are the largest eels the best for eating one weighing a pound is better for your purpose than a bulky fellow that weighs three skin and clean carefully extracting all the fat from the inside cut into lengths of an inch and a half pour into a saucepan with enough cold water to cover them throw in a little salt and chopped parsley and stew slowly closely covered for at least an hour add at the last a great spoonful of butter and a little flour wet with cold water also pepper serve in a deep dish the appearance and odor of this stew are so pleasing as often to overcome the prejudices of those who wouldn't touch an eel for the world they look like snakes and those who have tasted them rarely enter a second demure fried eels prepare as for stewing roll in flour and fry in hot lard or dripping to a light brown chowder number one take a pound of salt pork cut into strips and soak in hot water five minutes cover the bottom of a pot with a layer of this cut four pounds of cod or sea bass into pieces two inches square and lay enough of these on the pork to cover it follow with a layer of chopped onions a little parsley summer savory and pepper either black or cayenne then a layer of split boston or butter or whole cream crackers which have been soaked in warm water until moist through but not ready to break above this lay a stratum of pork and repeat the order given above onion seasoning not too much crackers and pork until your materials are exhausted let the topmost layer be buttered crackers well soaked put in enough cold water to cover all barely cover the pots too gently for an hour watching that the water does not sink too low should it leave the upper layer exposed replenish constantly from the tea kettle when the chowder is thoroughly done take out with a perforated skimmer and put into a tureen thicken the gravy with a tablespoonful of flour and about the same quantity of butter boil up and pour over the chowder send sliced lemon pickles and stewed tomatoes to the table with it that the guests may add if they like chowder number two slice six large onions and fry them in the gravy of fried salt pork cut five pounds of bass or cod into strips three inches long and one thick and line the bottom of a pot with them scatter a few slices of onion upon them a little salt half a dozen whole black peppers a clove or two a pinch of thyme and one of parsley a tablespoonful tomato or mushroom ketchup and six oysters then comes a layer of oyster crackers well soaked in milk and buttered thickly another layer of fish onion seasoning and crackers and so on until all are used up cover with water boil slowly for an hour and pour out serve with capers and sliced lemon 
a cup of oyster liquor added to the chowder while boiling improves it end of section six